Well, thank you very much, Morgan, uh, for that introduction. And Adrienne and Morgan, thank you for organizing this wonderful session. I'm just honored to be here with all of you today. Uh, just see really uh, a fantastic turnout of, of really top-notch people in this group. So I'm, I'm honored to be here. And Adrienne and, and Morgan are tough acts to follow. So I, I, I hope we can do this justice here. Um, so I'm gonna splash up my screen. Uh, hopefully go to full screen mode, here we go. So first I wanna point out that a lot of the work that we're gonna show here in the next few moments is available uh, as web interactive models on the cloud. If you go to nanohub.org and register with your Google account, then some of the links that we're gonna post up here during this talk, you can access that and you actually try to run the models uh, as we go through them here today. Uh, and if not, certainly then the slides are gonna be available and you can download them and, and click on the links and try the models on your own. Um, I'd be delighted if you found some of these models helpful, not just you know, for an uh, from a research perspective, but if they might actually be helpful in a classroom context, uh, perhaps if we could build the right scaffolding around it, uh, it'd be really fun to see if students got uh, some use out of these. Uh, so here I wanna kind of say that uh, the lecture materials, oops, I'm actually in the wrong talk. Let's fix that. That's not a great start, is it now? Let's try that again. Okay, so hello, Cody. Um, so I am going to try this one more time. So the slides for today are available at this hyperlink. If you go to github.com slash physicel-training slash cambam2020, or you can point your smartphone to this QR code here and go straight to it, you can download the PDFs for, the, for this for parts one and two of this talk. And there'll be hyperlinks throughout these for reference materials and where you can download codes. Um, and also I wanted to start this off with a really big thank you uh, to those who have helped support this work over the years. Uh, of course, the National Cancer Institute and the Breast Cancer Research Foundation have been fantastic in helping us to develop the simulation methods, which were originally developed for cancer and now we're using more broadly. Uh, the National Science Foundation has helped us to fund methods to turn uh, complex, you know, command line codes into uh, shareable models that we can share on, on the web and you can execute in a browser without having to worry about how to compile and run code. Uh, the Jane Koskinas Ted Giovannis Foundation for Health and Policy has been a tremendous supporter for us throughout the years, primarily uh, in breast cancer and then more recently they've been helping us to support a large coalition of modelers and epidemiologists, biologists and others uh, to build a multi-scale model of COVID-19 and would be delighted to answer questions on that at some point. And then of course, just we're grateful to the Indiana University for, for generous computing resources that we've used throughout our work. Uh, cancer, as you've seen already in the talks this morning, uh, is, is a complex systems problem. Uh, it's characterized really by interconnected systems and processes. You have single cell behaviors like cell motility, uh, cell cycling, cell division, uh, but also those cells don't work alone. They have uh, communication with one another. They secrete chemicals that diffuse in the environment reach another cell, the cell reads that chemical and decides to do something. And it turns out that cells can communicate mechanically, that they can sense that when they're being tugged or pulled or pushed or compressed. And they can actually tug on the extracellular matrix, uh, kind of the scaffolding structure of a tissue and transmit forces over long distances to communicate. Uh, cells, of course, are also subject to constraints because they're physical objects. Um, they need oxygen, glucose, and growth factors to survive. And those don't arrive by magic. They have to diffuse from blood vessels to reach the cells. And that means that diffusion processes can be rate limiting for cells. And now uh, the other constraints we're used to are things like membranes and boundaries that they, they have to dig their way through a membrane before they can leave one tissue and go to the next. And then of course, these, it, these systems are organized into higher order systems, systems of systems. Uh, the biggest example I think in cancer that you see all the time is the immune system. We have different cell types that work together and coordinate their responses to, um, to maintain a healthy individual and hopefully to cut down on problems. Now, in a normal, you know, in a healthy individual, these systems are well balanced. Uh, you get an infection, your immune system ramps up, then you take care of the infection and your immune system goes down again. Uh, you get an injury, cells start proliferating to fill in the gap and repair the tissue, and then when the tissue is repaired, they stop proliferating and everything's happy again. But in cancer, and many diseases, in fact, one or more parts of these systems become dysregulated and they fall out of balance. And so in cancer in particular, proliferation goes up, uh, apoptosis goes down, cells are able to survive where they shouldn't, the immune system gets evaded, and you, you get cancer. 
And treatments traditionally have been targeting parts of these systems. You might have a cytotoxic drug that really just targets proliferation, uh, or you might have an immunotherapeutic drug that just tries to ramp up the immune system. Uh, but what we know about complex systems is that if you target just one part of the system, uh, complex uh, you know, side effects can percolate through that complex system and catch you by surprise. And these lead to surprising side effects, uh, you know, which can be minor things like itchy skin, or can be really major things like treatment resistance, which you heard about this morning, or, or just uh, toxicity to other organs. So modeling is an opportunity to help us understand these complex systems. And that's the goal of multicellular systems biology, is to understand how different cells communicate and coordinate with one another or compete in with one another in these complex systems in the context of the 3D tissue. Uh, and if we can control these systems, then we've, re we've left the realm of systems biology to systems engineering. And I think that's the ultimate goal of any clinician is to control the system and make that patient healthy. So scientists use models to detangle complex systems. And if you ask a room full of scientists, the word model means a different thing. It could be an animal model. It could be a bioengineered model like 3D printed. It could be an in vitro model like a cell culture. And in our case, it's a mathematical or a computational model. And so one thing you might ask yourself is what would be the key components of a, of a virtual laboratory to study multicellular systems? Well, first of all, we know that diffusion is very important. We need growth substrates and metabolites and waste products. We know that cells are communicating chemically by diffusion. And if you're going to introduce a drug, it also has to diffuse in and reach your, your cells. And so you have to be able to solve not just one or two diffusion equations, but five or 10 or more. So that's very important. And then you have to model cells inside these chemical environments. We know that their behaviors will depend upon their, uh, their microenvironment, how they sample it. So there's going to be some kind of a multi, uh, like a molecular scale logic in those cells. Uh, they don't act alone. They have to interact mechanically, push each other around and stick. And you have to account for heterogeneity, that each cell may have different properties and states. And so that's why we're going to be approaching agent-based modeling in a moment. And once you build this model, so you have a chemical environment, have cells wandering around, and you're just running one copy of the model, that's an interesting sampling or an experiment, but it's really not science yet because it's a stochastic system. You really need to study across the parameter space and also across the stochasticity of the model. And so what you really need to do is to turn this from a fun prototype to science is you need to be able to run many copies of your model in high throughput. And this is where high throughput computing and high performance computing really start to come in. And machine learning helps you to start make sense of what's happening with your work. So what is an agent-based model? You saw uh, a wonderful introduction by Adrian earlier this morning, but really uh, a good way to think about it is in terms of software engineering, if, you, if, you've, if you've been on that side, uh, this is kind of classical object-oriented programming where each cell is a separate software object or an agent that can act independently. Uh, like most classes in software, it has member data, that's its own internal variables so that that specific agent, that, that object, is allowed to manipulate on its own and to have its own copies. And then it has methods. These are functions that act upon the member data. So your member data for in the context of cell biology might be your position, your size, where are you right now in the cell cycle, your molecular variables. Then the methods are the cellular processes, like going through cell cycling, going through a death process, being motile, growing and changing your volume. And those how they act upon your member data. Virtual cells move around in a virtual microenvironment. It's usually it's liquid filled, like water and interstitial fluid. You have to have the chemical movement that we talked about earlier, and it may have some kind of mechanical coupling between components. And you saw a really wonderful example of that in Adrian's earlier work this morning. So you have these agents that are walking around in a, in a virtual microenvironment. And so how do you connect that to the biology and physics? Well, the cell agents allow you a method to kind of encode our biological knowledge as hypotheses. That you, first of all, you work with domain experts and say, what's important to my problem? And you choose the member data or the cell variables uh, based upon what's important to your particular problem. Uh, then you choose your cell rules based upon uh, your observations and your experiments. You talk to your biologist and say, what do you see when you look under the microscope? They might see, for example, that some cells, when they're in low oxygen conditions, ramp up motility, downregulate cycling, and, and move around. Uh, so you encode that as a rule in your agents. And then the microenvironment helps you impose your, your physical constraints, transport processes, and mechanics, and things like this. Now, most agent-based models are actually going to combine both discrete mathematics and continuum mathematics. The agents, because they have their own pieces and there are integer number of agents wandering around, you can't have half an agent or pi agents, uh, that's a discrete model. Then and they move under stochastic processes like changing states in a discrete manner. 
Uh, but then you have continuum on top of that to model things like partial differential equations. You usually put these together and you end up with a hybrid continuum discrete approach. So really, if you kind of take this back, there are really some key elements for an agent-based multicellular model. First, you have to talk about the stage, if you think of this as like a play. Uh, it's the environment. You know, what are the uh, diffusing chemical species? Do you need to model the mechanics? Do you need to model things like blood vessels? You need the players. These are the cell types, one or more cell types. Maybe you have cancer types. Maybe you have subclones. They have more than one cancer type. Uh, maybe you have host and stromal cells like uh, fibroblasts or immune cell types. And then those cells need to follow a script. And that's their behaviors and their parameters. And that gives you information on their cycling and interaction, things like this. So really, it boils down to where do they live, who's there, and what do they do? And if you can answer these three questions, you can build an agent-based model. So let me start with an example before we get too far into business cell. Uh, I'm going to give, uh, I'm sorry? Oh, I thought there was a, a question. So we're going to give an example of a really simple biological system that's actually uh, pretty fun. Uh, so the stage here is that we have two diffusing chemical signals. The players are three cell types. Directors are green, and they secrete a director signal to attract workers. So there's the rule. Uh, cargo cells are blue. They are uh, sitting there, and when they're undocked, they are secreting a, a chemical called a cargo signal to attract workers. And they're saying, hey, I'm a, I have a package available for delivery, come pick me up. And then when they're docked, they turn off that signal. Then red are the workers. And when they're undocked, they're looking for cargo. So they do chemotaxis to look up the cargo signal. And when then they are docked, they say, okay, I have a package, I better go deliver it. Where do I deliver it? And so they seek the directors by chemotaxis following that director signal. And when that director signal gets strong enough, they sense proximity and drop off their cargo. So let's see this thing in action. Let's click this little link here and go to nanohub.org. And so that should open up in a web browser. Uh, don't mind my 15 zillion tabs here. So I need to log in first. So I'm going to log in with my Google account. And it's always a little bit of risk of trying something cloud-based for a tutorial, but let's give it a go. Click on Launch Tool. And this little spinny dot here is spinning up a Jupyter Notebook running on a server in San Diego right now waiting for a proxy. Okay, well, hopefully that will, okay, well, that's good. We're in the gate. So now this, uh, these gears are spinning. This tells us that a Jupyter notebook is loading up and we can see a few elements here to work through a tab. These little gears are running. There's an about tab that gives you information about the model. So you can do, for example, background mathematical material. Uh, configuration basics sets things like how big is our simulation domain. Uh, the microenvironment gives us information on these diffusing signals. Uh, user parameters is where we start doing uh, parameters for you know, specific parameters for the specific model. And then we're going to click on run here and it's running again remotely on a server in San Diego. And then the results are being popped up here into this notebook so we can actually start visualizing this model as we go. So we've already simulated, you know, 80 minutes in this particular model. So let's click on the output tab. And if you can follow along, that's fantastic. Otherwise, please consider this as a, as a walkthrough. You can watch the video and, and go through these slides at your own pace later on. Uh, but you can click on the output tab and you start sliding the frame and we can start advancing the simulation. So here we're plotting the director signal. So you can see that these green cells are secreting the director signal. And we have blue clumps of undelivered cargo and we have these red cells. And you can see how the red cells, if we slide along, the red cells pick up cargo and are dragging it over to the director signal and dropping it off. And then once they're done, they, they go and they seek more cargo. So if you run the simulation over time, that you see that these very basic rules into a complex multiplayer system is enough to start giving some emergent complex dynamics. And that's really the name of the game in an agent-based model. So that the individual agents can have very, very simple rules, but the multicellular logic can actually be quite, quite interesting and you get these neat emergent effects of it. So if anyone is a synthetic biologist, I would love to try to build this thing. So uh, give me a call if someone's doing that. So there's just one example of an agent-based model to kind of show you the idea that we have these different players responding to chemical cues and they're modifying the behavior accordingly. And you get complex dynamics that emerge and eventually you get all the cargo delivered. So let's go ahead and terminate this app and go back to our PowerPoint slides. So 
Uh, if you want to work this deck, actually, I have some suggestions of how you might explore this particular app to get a further intuition on the particular model and on agent-based modeling in, in general. Uh, and so it kind of gives some different parameters you should consider uh, modifying when you run it. So let's introduce Physicel, which is our particular agent-based modeling system. So remember we talked about you need an environment. So knowing that we had to solve lots of diffusion equations, we spent a couple of years just modeling diffusion. We built something called BioFBM. It's a finite volume method that can simulate five or 10 or more diffusing substrates in 3D on a single desktop workstation or on a single compute node on a cluster. Uh, we built it to be second order accurate in space, first order accurate in time. It's numerically stable. We've tested it and the performance scales very nicely where uh, in traditional approaches, if you're doing 10 PDEs, you simulate them one at a time, which means that the computational cost of simulating 10 PDEs is 10 times the cost of simulating one PDE. But what we found is because we vectorized everything and we worked really hard to optimize it, our, th that slope for us is less than one. And the computational cost of simulating five to 10 PDEs is really more like double the computational cost of just simulating one PDE. So the slope is much less than one. And that makes it much more computationally tractable to solve these problems in 3D biology we really do need multiple chemical diffusion equations. So it's all cross-platform, open source, and available at Bioinformatics. And it is the, kind of the, the beginning part of Physicel. So on top of that, BioFBM had a bunch of static cell agents off lattice that could secrete and uptake as these sources and sinks in your PDEs. Now make it biological that each one of those cell agents is off lattice, but now they can start moving around. They have uh, potential functions for adhesion and repulsion. They have a biased random migration. Uh, each one of these agents has a cell cycle state, and so it can progress through the cell cycle and have death processes, so it can become apoptotic or necrotic or whatever. Uh, we have uh, the ability for these cells to secrete and uptake chemical factors, uh, and then can attach custom functions and data on a cell-by-cell -cell basis. You can really uh, customize these particular to your own particular problem. This is also cross-platform compatible. We routinely use it on Windows, Linux, and OS X. And uh, the nice thing is that the computational cost, using some tricks, uh, scales is order n. So if you double the number of agents, the compute cost goes up by a factor of two, not by a factor of four, which is something that you have to worry about. So in this particular example, we have some very simple rules. We have oxygen diffusing from the outside in, and so oxygen gets depleted as it gets into that tumor, and so eventually you see some cells running out of oxygen and running out of energy, and they become necrotic. So that's these brown guys here in the center. We also give some heterogeneity to this problem, that the yellow cells are more able to respond to oxygen and they can cycle a little faster than the blue neighbors. The blue guys have less of that oncogenic protein, let's say, and so they're a little bit less able to respond to oxygen to proliferate. So they get all competed like you expect. So you start with a very salt and pepper heterogeneity and you see that these yellow clones of faster growing cells start to emerge and then the cell, this tumor becomes more and more heterogeneous because of the selection process. Uh, then where the stochasticity, um, and mechanics kick in, it gets interesting because the yellow cells don't just outcompete the blue cells, they grow to the food sources faster, surround the blue cells, and push them into the necrotic core. So they're actually pushing their competition to death. And that's something that emerges by the stochastic spatial aspect of this model compared to, say, a classical competition model in, in an ODE that doesn't account for the mechanics. So there's just an example of simple model rules leading to some interesting phenomena. So the key parts of a physicist cell model, let me try to keep track of time here too. I want to make sure we don't go too long. The key parts of a physical cell model really is that you have your microenvironment. This is where you define your chemical diffusing substrates. And so you need your diffusion coefficient, you need your decay rate, you need boundary and initial conditions. Uh, and all these can be defined in an XML configuration file now. Uh, on top of that thing, again, you need your players. And so we have something called cell definitions where you define one or more different cell types in your XML file and you give them their default phenotype, which is their default uh, behavioral parameters. Um, and then when you get down to a, your model, now you kind of set the stage. You say, I know my environment, and I know the types of cell types that are available. Now you need to actually place some of those agents in your environment. And so you have to place a cell in the environment, say, what type are you? What are your state variables? And then, um, and then you have your phenotype, which is how we bundle up all the behavioral phenotypes into one software object that we can pass from one cell to another or easily manipulate in a standardized way. And then on top of that, each cell agent can have custom variables and custom functions that act upon the phenotype, the variables, or the state. And that's really where the biology and the hypotheses and the rulemaking come in. So 
Um, I don't want to spend most of this talk going on the mathematical details, but I want to kind of give you a, a taste of what's inside the model. Uh, so first of all, uh, in physics cell, really we regard the phenotype as the key thing because cell agents are really about cell behavior. And the phenotype is a way for us to organize in a hierarchical way the different elements of cell behaviors because there are only so many things that a cell really needs to do. It needs to cycle and get ready to divide. It needs to maybe die. It has a volume that it has to control. It has a shape and a size, so it's geometry. It has mechanics because the stick can push on things. It has motility because cells crawl around. They have to secrete chemical factors. And then you might attach molecular scale models on top of them. And these are kind of the key processes that every single cell does, but just at different rates and with different hypotheses. And so we organize these processes by behavior. And then each one of these you know, different blocks of the phenotype has its own individual parameters and models. So for example, cell cycle for us is a directed graph that a cell cycle has one or more phases. So for example, the classical model is G0, G1 cells go to S phase, go to G2 phase, go to M phase, divide in half to, to give you two daughter cells back in G0, G1 state. So for us, those nodes on the graph are cell cycle phases and the edges are the transition rates between them. And so we store this as a directed graph uh, in our cycle part of the phenotype and you worry more about saying if the, if the graph structure is not defined, then you define the transition rates. And those transition rates can be stochastic or constant. Uh, death is similar to a cell cycle model where you have uh, one or more death models and you say, what's my rate of, of apoptotic death? It means how, uh, what's my rate at which a cell wants to enter the apoptotic cascade? And remember that death is a funny thing at the cell scale. They, death is not like an instantaneous event. Uh, a cell becomes apoptotic, which means it's dying, not dead. And it's using energy to degrade that cell and eventually be removed from the simulation or from the tissue. Necrotic cells are similar, right? Um, they're dead in the sense, but they don't disappear instantaneously. The debris lingers for a long time. There's still some energy consuming processes here and there and chemical processes just degrading them. So uh, really at the cell scale, you need to think about uh, dying cells and not just dead live and dead cells. And that's what we're thinking about. Uh, volume, we just have a couple of ODEs that we pop in to allow cells to grow or shrink towards the target volume. Uh, and then if you approximate it as a sphere, you can get the cell sizes. And the neat thing is we can use the exact same volume model for, for all types of cells, for live and dead cells or dying or dead cells. Uh, mechanics, we're just using really basic potential functions based upon the distance between cells. This allows us to really simplify the way we do the modeling for now. And I'd like to point out that we are modeling cell volume, but not cell shape, which means that we know how big they are. We know how far they can act, but we don't really know their particular shape. So it's, it's almost like a probability. Um, motility is a bit of an interesting thing because we have a, a biased random walk. So for every cell, uh, if motility is enabled, then you give it a speed and a direction independently. The speed is the direction is it wants to travel, say microns per minute. The bias direction says, what direction do I want to go? So that could, for example, be a unit vector aligned along a chemical gradient. And then the cool thing is that we choose to then next a, a, a random vector. And then your bias says, how much do I pay attention to my bias direction, the direction I want to go versus the random direction? So if bias is zero, this little b, then you give a weight completely to your random vector and you have Brownian motion. And if your bias parameter is one, then you completely ignore your random vector and you go completely along the, the deterministic vector, and you have deterministic motion. And anywhere in between, you have a bias random walk. And then the last parts of that is that you pick a, a persistence time, you say, I choose a direction based upon this direct, motile direction that's a little bit random and a little bit deterministic. And then I pick a persistence time and say, I, I go in that direction for that persistent time in addition to my other forces. And then after persistence time, I sample again and say, what's my new direction? You can start tracing out uh, a path. And so uh, we do have an example uh, of actually a, a NanoHub app that lets you play around with the parameters of this model to really see what kinds of cell trucks you can get out of the different parameters. Uh, secretion. Uh, we solve a vector of PDEs. And so secretion really is the net secretion. It's the way the cells secrete and uptake and export and act as source and sink terms in that PDE. And so uh, really what you end up doing then is on a cell by cell basis, you set the parameters for your secretion rate, your uptake rate, your other generalized export, and then um, 
you can modulate these over time for any cell. And that's the beauty of an agent-based model, is that these parameters don't have to be fixed. You can change them dynamically at will based upon whatever your, your model's assumptions are. And that can be very difficult to pull off in a continuum-based approach. Uh, the molecular is a placeholder, but we're building support for what's called systems biology and markup language. So you can build systems of ODEs or Boolean networks and include them in individual cells, then relate the behavior of that Boolean network or that ODE network to your cell phenotype parameters. So that's a work in progress, but coming soon. And so really the, the paradigm uh, when you build a physical cell model is to program the phenotype that we have built all these processes into the core framework. Uh, you don't have to worry about adding little incremental bits to your cell volume and then deciding whether to split it into half. You don't have to do instantiation of two new software objects and worry about all that stuff and, and memory cleanup and everything else. We've built cell cycling into the program and cell depth and motility and mechanics. And so what you can focus on as a mathematician, as a modeler and as a mathematical biologist is to say, what are my rules? Can I just, I already have cell cycling built for me. What I want to control is when to admit it, when to use uh, cell cycling or when to start death. And so you focus on building functions that read the environment, read the state and set your rate parameters for all these different phenotypic processes to tell the cell what to do next. So let's see here. Um, and then just, I want to note that this is a problem with many time scales. And so our code is designed to take advantage of that, that we have a very fast time step for diffusion processes of by default 0.01 minutes, an intermediate time step for mechanics, and then a longer time step for phenotype processes because the cell isn't deciding what to do on a second by second basis necessarily. This is for things like progressions of the cell cycle where your time scales on the order of half an hour to an hour to, to days or more. So not every process is sampled at every computational time. Um, so some examples in the kinds of context. Uh, one example we've done very recently, we have a paper uh, under revision, is we built a model of uh, metastatic seeding into a liver tissue. And then the question we asked is, what about the parenchyma, the liver tissue around it? Uh, what does it do? Because uh, what we model is uh, basically a plastoelastic model that the, uh, the liver tissue actually pushes back on the tumor. And so depending upon the balance of all these forces, that liver tissue may actually compress the tumor so much that it never wants to grow, because it can stay dormant. On the other hand, if the tumor can adjust and the liver tissue adjusts slightly differently, the liver tissue can get displaced and, and move out of the way and maybe it dies off to make space for the tumor. So you can look at these balances of competition and mechanics. Uh, the middle model is a cancer immunotherapy model, which you, you might've seen this animation before, and we'll discuss this a bit more in the future. Uh, actually just in a moment. And then the model on the right is some great work we're doing with Daniel Gilks at Johns Hopkins University and Abe Rocha is a uh, postdoc on it, funded by uh, JK, uh, the Jane Koskinas Ted Jones Foundation for Health and Policy, where we're actually looking at uh, what happens if you can image hypoxic cells and track where they go. And this allows you to see structures you didn't see before and the mathematics gives you a way to explain them. Because what it turns out is we were able to ask a, a really neat question as um, a cell becomes hypoxic, it adjusts its phenotype to match, it compensates. And then that cell escapes hypoxic conditions. What does it do? Does it return to its old behavior of a nomoxic cell, slowing down motility and things like that? Or does it retain that old aggressive hypoxic phenotype forever? And it turns out that the answer to that question makes a critical difference on health a tumor disseminates its invasive cells. And so that's a, a project we're actually writing up a paper on right now. And uh, maybe in another seminar talk, we can share the results further. Uh, I want to point out that this software does not sit alone, that we're trying to build it into a software ecosystem. And so all the web-based apps that we've been showing you here and that we'll show you in just a few moments uh, are based upon piping a, a command line, you know, C++ code for a physical cell model through a Python script to generate a Jupyter notebook. And that acts as a graphical user interface you can host that in the cloud to make a, a shared model on the web. And we've developed a way to streamline that so that you really, if you can build a model, you can get it online pretty, pretty quickly. And so that has some nice implications, I think, for, for education among other things. We actually use it to share as part of our method section in our papers now to say, try the model yourself as you're reading this paper. And so we think it's gonna be a critical part of future uh, in uh, scientific communication. So let me get into now a more detailed example in cancer. So here, we have uh, the, the same heterogeneous model that I showed you earlier, the same heterogeneous tumor, uh, where the yellow cells are a little bit weirder than the blue cells, let's say. Let's say that they're more immunogenic. So on top of that, we're gonna add another player, immune cells, these red things. 
And so they're gonna be following a biased random migration, looking for secreted factors by the tumor cells, and they'll test for contact. So they'll collide with the cell. And when they do, just like uh, Adrienne this morning talked about hooking and springs, they're gonna form an elastic adhesion to that cell and stay stuck like a spring. And while they're stuck, they're gonna sample the properties of the tumor cell to say, are you immunogenic? If so, I'm gonna to try to kill you off and induce apoptosis. And if that succeeds, fantastic, this, the immune cell breaks off and keeps wandering and looks for another target. But if it doesn't succeed, then it stays put for some mean amount of time, continuing to try to kill off the tumor cell. So it becomes an interesting trade-off, right? Uh, on the one hand, if the immune cell gives up too early and just wanders off, then it's gonna miss an opportunity to kill off that, that tumor cell. On the other hand, if it stays adhered to one cell too long and it's, it's fruitless and, and not productive, then that immune cell is passing up better targets somewhere else. So you want some kind of an optimal mix of staying adhered long enough to get a, a kill, but not so long that you're, not, that you're trying to kill things that you have no hope of killing. And so uh, we got some interesting results modeling this. We certainly got the selection processes. But the interesting thing is, even though the yellow cells are more susceptible to the tumor cells, I'm sorry, to the immune cells, uh, because of the stochasticity of the model and the fact that the tumor immune cells were following a random path and not looking left and right, they ended up kind of clumping up near the, uh, the local maximum of some of these uh, inflammatory factors and, and cleared out all the competition. Now the yellow cells that would have been more susceptible had plenty of open space to proliferate and take over. So they actually outcompeted, even though they were more susceptible to the tumors, uh, to the immune cells. So these are the kinds of examples of surprises that can pop up from stochasticity and 3D modeling and, and agent-based modeling uh, compared to non-spatial modeling. So one model was fun, and we published this one in PLOS Computational Biology uh, several years ago, but it's just a prototype by itself. And we said, you know, there are a few parameters we're interested in, the migration bias of how random is the motion of the, the, of the immune cells, uh, how quickly can they form an attachment and how long do they stay attached? Well, that's three parameters. So let's say you go low, medium, high. That's 27 parameter sets. It's stochastic, so you better do 10 runs per parameter set. That's 270 simulations. The simulation takes about a weekend. So you're talking about a year and a half of computing if you do these things end on end. So clearly that's not feasible. You need high throughput computing. And so we uh, had a great fortune of meeting up at Argonne National Lab, ran all 270 runs over a weekend and, and got a really nice paper and some interesting nonlinearity and results out of it. But that was just a start. We knew we listed a lot of uh, parameters. Uh, so let's say you add more parameters. Now you've got a six dimensional hypercube of a design space. That's even on high throughput, you know, high performance computing, that's too much to brute force. And so we decided to kind of uh, take a different approach here to think about modeling just various scenarios saying, under what parameter sets can you obtain cancer control where the final population count does not exceed the initial count? Uh, then we looked at two remission scenarios saying, uh, in what case, uh, what parameter sets allow you to reduce your population of cancer cells by 90% or by 99%? And then the more traditional question of optimizations, which is a question that came up in the chat window earlier. Um, and so what we did is we actually used some active learning uh, to help guide the investigations, saying that for any one of those scenarios, your six-dimensional hyperspace is basically a binary classifier. For any point in your parameter space, you either meet your criterion or you do not. And so what you do is you use uh, active learning to say, I'm going to sprinkle a bunch of simulations into my, my six-dimensional space, evaluate them to say, were they true or false? And then the next batch of simulations gets chosen to help you to resolve the decision boundary of your, of your binary classifier. And so what we found is that we were able to speed up our simulations by a factor of a thousand to really resolve that boundary. And then by building nested scenarios, saying first control, then cut it by 90%, then cut it by 99%, we were able to kind of nucleate the, uh, the surfaces from the previous scenarios and get the topology of the design space. So that was kind of cool. The neat thing too is that the Gini coefficients of your decision tree help you to rank the importance of the parameters. And so we got the topology of the design space. We were able to reduce uh, by a ridiculous amount the number of simulations that we wanted to do. And we were able to do this thing really over, you know, just a handful of hours in a cluster. So that was quite nice. Um, and saw parameters and we found where the immune uh, apoptosis rates. So this really says that the longer your immune cells stay effective, that's probably the most important constraint out of all the constraints and parameters in this model. That was the single most important one. The second one was just the detection threshold. So uh, that was interesting because there are no molecular level results, but it matches well to molecular insights you've seen in the literature. And so you can try this model yourself and I'd encourage you to. It's kind of fun and mesmerizing to watch the simulations. 
uh, you just go to this uh, QR code or you click on the hyperlink and, and try the model out. Uh, so we have just a little bit of time left before I think we get to a break, uh, about, about 10 to 15 minutes as I understand it. So let's just try some examples to kind of close out uh, part one of the talk. The idea again to be, you know, first we introduced agent-based modeling. We showed our particular agent-based model system and a few cancer examples. Now I want to give some more interactive examples to close out the end of part one of this session. In part two, we're going to get a little bit more of our hands dirty of looking a little bit more at the guts of the code and uh, how these things work, building a model, uh, compiling it, looking at the data in a Jupyter notebook, and then to the very end, we're going to try to build a model in C++. Now, again, that will be kind of like a, a walkthrough where we, we don't expect in a 45 minute context for everyone to keep pace, so don't worry. Uh, but the instructions will be here and kind of look back on this video as a way to kind of give you those uh, signposts to get through it. But let's try some examples now. So first one I want to do is a heterogeneity example. So this one you've actually already seen that each cell has this oncoprotein P that can be any positive value. And the more oncoprotein P, uh, the faster you can respond to oxygen to enter the cycle. So cells with more oxygen divide faster, cells with more P divide faster. And so we'll color them by that, that if they're blue, they have a low value of P, and if they're gold, they have a high value of P. And I believe in this particular model, uh, they will be orange if they are necrotic, if they die from energy collapse. So let's go ahead and start up this, this model. I'm sorry I haven't been watching the chat screen, but hopefully Randy is. Um, but I will spin up this model here. And while that lab equipment is going, I'll work with my important coffee-based lab equipment. And let's uh, look at a few exercises. So what we're going to do is we're going to modify some of the parameters in this simulation run. Uh, first of all, just to make it a little bit faster so we can keep it interactive for this session, uh, but also just so we can explore some of the science of this model. Okay, so it is spinning up. And sometimes it doesn't quite completely load. And in that case, uh, just refreshing your browser seems to do the trick. So I'm gonna refresh the browser now. Apparently we have some work left to do with San Diego and Purdue. Same basic setup, we have an about tab, config basics about your domain. And so we want this to simulate a little faster. So let's change the maximum simulation time from this really big value to just 57, 60 minutes, which is gonna give you a couple of days. And uh, let's not simulate, let's not send out data quite somewhat often. Let's just go every 120 minutes or every two hours. And otherwise, uh, I want to go and set the standard deviation in that oncoprotein to zero, which means that they all have the same value of one. So let's go ahead and run this. So this is basically the model, this is like your control case. You have no heterogeneity in your model parameters right now. And so every cancer cell is the same. So Let's see what this thing looks like. And we won't necessarily finish the simulation. Let's just get it going to, to get us a feeling for it. So now we can click on the out tab, and start scrolling this slider bar to progress through our simulation frames as they go. And so here I'm gonna plot the oxygen along with the, the cells here. So we look here in the window and it's starting the simulation. So it's gonna take just a moment to start up. Usually it doesn't take this long. Well, if this doesn't start up, if this doesn't get much progress soon, then we may close this down and restart this thing. Okay, now we're making some progress. So we just simulated the first two hours here. I guess it's the danger of not outputting very often. So here you can see that the cells all have the same color. They're heterogeneous in that oncoprotein because that's how we colored them. We have a few apoptotic cells popping up here. And as this thing progresses further, we're going to start seeing some necrotic cells in the, sort, in, in the core. Now, I don't think that we're going to keep this particular run going just because it's going to take a while. Um, what you would see is the cells are all identical. So this is, there's not going to be much to change the symmetry of this particular problem. We're definitely not going to see a lot of competition. Let's go ahead and hit head and hit cancel to cancel this run. And I think I'm gonna do a couple of things here. I'm gonna make the simulation domain smaller. 
as with a smaller simulation domain, it should take less time to run. And um, let's pop the cells a little bit more often so we can see results more quickly. And um, I think I'm going to, we could add heterogeneity, but you've already seen the results. So I think I'll skip straight to exercise number three. I'm going to make a much bigger standard deviation in the oncoprotein. And I'm going to change this alkyl protein mass just to three standard deviations plus the mean so that I don't cap off too many of these values. So basically, we're starting to pick um, values in this oncoprotein protein according to a normal distribution. But then if it's below zero, we're going to chop it off at zero. And if it's above 10, we're going to chop it off at 10. And let's go ahead and run with these new parameters. Hopefully this time it goes a little faster. And this time too, I'm having an output more frequently. So you can start seeing this dynamics just a little bit faster. Uh, even though here we're getting it. Okay, so let's rewind. So here now we see a, a big distribution. We have a lot of them biased towards low values because we had a big spread, you know, kind of a long tail of distributions. And if you scroll this along, you should start seeing some of the yellow cells starting to outcompete the, the blue cells. And so here we've gone a couple of hours, four hours. And as we continue, we should start seeing these little yellow clones expanding within this larger tumor. And so, and then down here in the output, you can see this is what it would look like if you're running this locally on your computer with a, without a graphical user interface, kind of like the, an old style simulator but all that output still is available here if you need it for debugging. So we've simulated out quite a bit. We already have a good amount of cell proliferation from the original number. You can kind of scroll it through. This little spinning gear set here says that there is data on the way to and from the servers at San Diego. So please be patient while those gears are spinning. We can definitely see now that these yellow guys are out competing and what you should also see is some loss of symmetry in this tumor, that whenever these clones start to emerge, that's perturbing the symmetry of the problem. And so uh, that's one of, the, one of the emergent effects from this when acting in a spatial context. So let's go ahead and let that run and move on to some other examples. Uh, one more example is, imagine uh, I showed you the bio robots and I showed you the heterogeneity example. What happens if we were to put these together in some kind of a hypothetical uh, treatment? Uh, really the idea is that we need something to give direction. Uh, so imagine that the blue cells are not just cargo containers anymore, but they actually have some kind of a cancer drug inside them. And so what we want to do is we want to drag those cells into the cancer and release the drugs to kill it. But they need a director signal. But it turns out that in cancer, you have hypoxic gradients. So remember how they absorb oxygen so you get farther into the tumor, the oxygen gets lower? Well, that's a natural gradient that correlates with the tumor. And so we're gonna use hypoxia as our, um, as our director signal. So we'll click on launch tool and get that running. And in the meantime, let's look at this heterogeneity example and see how this competition really has, uh, will eventually start popping up in these clones and you're gonna see this thing start to lose symmetry. And so if you were to run it with, with homogeneous parameters, this thing would stay circular much, much longer because there'd be no reason for it to break symmetry. Okay, so that one's going. Uh, so let's look at the cancer bio robots example. And while that's running, I have uh, in the PowerPoint, in the, in the slides, I have some suggestions for different parameters to try. Uh, I think because we're running a little bit short on time, I don't want to go through the full set of exercises. But if I were you, and if I were exploring this, I would encourage you to kind of run through these in sequence to add different components to the model one at a time to see what every component is adding by itself. Do the cancer cells only? Well, you're basically the heterogeneity model. So let's do this. Let's, let's combine these two here together. I want to simulate this on a smaller domain, uh, but I want to make the tumor a little bigger. So I'm going to give it an initial in, uh, radius of uh, 400 microns instead of 200. That way, we, I, just, I want to see things happen a little sooner. And also, I want to inject those therapy cells much, much sooner. So let's uh, inject them at time 120 minutes rather than waiting, you know, basically a week of treatment. So let's go ahead and I think we have what we need. Max time to 4320, doesn't really matter. So let's go ahead and click on run. 
and we will eagerly await this thing. So it's, it has started running. We see that it's starting to get into the main loop of the simulator now. It has to start up and kind of initialize the diffusion solver. We've simulated our first hour here, so we should be able to see some data here in the notebook. So there we go. Here's, we have an oxygen gradient here. We have our cancer cells over here. And now we have more diffusing substrates. So what I'd like to do is let's see, let's plot this by the chemotractant of the uh, of the workers. So we're uh, at two hours. So let's give it just a second more. So here's this little spinning gear that says that we're getting data. We inject a mix of workers and cargo. So here you can see that that cargo signal is very strong near this concentration of cargo cells. And then we have some worker bees that have picked up some of their cargo and they're wandering up hypoxic gradients uh, to find the tumor. So the neat thing is that you kind of have this guided self-guiding treatment. You say, you know, I know there's a tumor nearby here somewhere. I might well be missing it, but this cargo delivery system can take your therapy to the tumor. So now we can see where the multicellular logic is pretty interesting. So here you can see these, uh, cargo cell, these workers are dragging the drug loaded cargo towards the tumor and eventually they'll get there. And so I'm going to next plot the therapeutic, the drug being released by the, uh, by the cargo. And right now they haven't been delivered. So there's no drug being delivered just yet. See some necrosis popping up in the center of the tumor. And we just about have some cargo reaching the tumor. So right now, no no therapeutic delivered just yet, but at any moment now, those cells are going to reach. Any, any moment now. <laughs> so we have them just reaching the edge of the tumor now. And we give them just a moment longer, they'll punch their way in and reach sufficiently low oxygen to drop off their cargo. So we'll go ahead and let that run rather than kind of watching progress here. But that's the model you to explore. Now, some interesting things that happen here, right? The cargo, the worker cells are guided by low oxygen. So there's a natural feedback in the system that we didn't account for when we designed our, our hypothetical treatment. When the tumor shrinks, there are less things sucking up oxygen, which means that oxygen can become restored as the tumor gets smaller. Tumor gets bigger, oxygen goes down. Tumor gets smaller, oxygen goes back up. And so if that tumor shrinks enough, the oxygen doesn't drop below that threshold and the workers don't know where to drop off their cargo. They, they know where to go, but they haven't reached that signal. And so the interesting thing is that this therapy actually cannot shrink a tumor below a certain threshold size because once the tumor gets too small, the, the, the workers lose their, their signal and they don't know where to drop off their cargo. So that's an interesting effect of this interacting system here. So here, we finally have some cells reaching the tumor. And uh, yep, now you can see the contours of the drug being delivered and you start seeing some depth here in this edge of the tumor. So what I suggest is, you know, explore this model. It's really fun too, to look at the stochasticity of the worker behavior, because if they're more random in their motion, they might just, they might drop their cargo more around the edges of that tumor and might get a better drug distribution. So that's a, a fun thing that can pop up in a model like this. So we have a whole variety of models you can explore using this modeling system, all of them available on NanoHub to try interactively, even without downloading the code. Uh, some of these we've already looked at, for example, the heterogeneity one, the cancer robots one we just looked at. Uh, this is a random motility uh, one. Uh, but what I also suggest you look at is a uh, cancer immunotherapy model, and we have a COVID-19 model that we've been putting online. Uh, so I will continue to update this slide. There are a few more models actually I think you might enjoy um, looking at. And then of course, every physical download has a bunch of models built in and bundled. Uh, so in the next part of this, uh, after the break, we're going to download the physical code set from GitHub, uh, just as a big zip file. We're gonna compile and run our first project and explore it a little bit. We're gonna look at how to read data in Jupyter. And at the very end, we're gonna just have a taste of building our own cancer model in XML. Uh, so I think we're at the break, but I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, so there, thanks very much, Paul. We have had some questions during your talk. So if you want to maybe 
uh, look through the chat or if people, um, yeah, you could answer them there. Um, and we are going to take a 15 minute break, if I'm not mistaken. That's correct. 15 minute break. So we'll come back at, let's say, 315 Eastern um, and uh, we'll start part two. So thank you very much. Looking forward. Yeah, thanks, everyone. And uh, let's see, I see some questions from Lisette and from Etienne. Uh, are you guys, and Bianca, are you guys, um, uh, are you still here or should we try to answer now or, or, or wait until after break? Yeah, why don't we, I will try to type some of the answers here into the window and then people can get a break, which is probably a good idea. And I guess this is kind of a guided tour into running and visualizing data in the physical cell model. And then we're gonna just barely close by building a model at the very end here. Uh, 3D code to run on your desktop is available in every physical cell download. Okay, so let's go ahead and uh, get to this uh, code here. Um, so first step here is let's go ahead and download physical cell. So there are two places that we officially maintain uh, physical cell uh, for downloads on GitHub or on SourceForge. So I'm going to, going to just click on this SourceForge link here. And what we encourage you to do is to go and get the latest release. So here's the readme that talks about you know, readme rules, changes, things like this. If you scroll down to the very bottom, you're going to see assets. And that's where we're going to download just here the zip file that has the most recent code. You can see I've done this recently. Um, so I've downloaded my code. It's not particularly big. It's about five megabytes here. So I'm going to go ahead and unzip this, extract all. And on your operating system, it would be slightly different, but you need to extract the zip file. Uh, I think OSX, if you click in, on something and putting your downloads, I think it already automatically uh, extracts it. So now I'm going to go and uh, I'm going to be using Anaconda. So for me, I'm going to do Anaconda PowerShell prompt. And for you, this might be different. Um, you could probably just do any terminal window. Uh, I just want this to have the proper Anaconda environment for later. So. If you're on Windows, I suggest if you have installed Anaconda to get your Python and Jupyter, go ahead and click on this Anaconda PowerShell window or just type in Anaconda down here. And you'll see, uh, you know, some kind of an environment pop up here. It might be Anaconda shell prompt or terminal, but this is basically a command line window that has all the environment for Anaconda loaded, including, you know, graphics and windows and stuff like that. So now I'm here. And I'm going to browse to where I extracted my code. So for me, I make a mess of my download folder and it's in here. So I'm going to copy and paste in that path into downloads. Uh, yeah, I should clean out my download folder at some point. So I'm going to change into physicel download here. And then you've changed into this physical cell directory, and now you're in your root directory for your physical cell download. So you see a handful of things here. We'll come back to this in just a moment. So we've downloaded physical cell from one of the two repositories. We've extracted it, and we've opened up a, um, a terminal to get into the actual directory where we download. So here, if I were in my download folder, here's physical cell the thing I just extracted. Here's the actual code directory. This is where you want to be in your terminal window. Okay, so I'm going to leave that open and go back to the PowerPoint slides. So you're, huh, somehow that red arrow got moved. So I want to go back and fix my slide just briefly. So open the terminal window here. This is the one we want right here. Okay, so there are different ways to enter a, a, a terminal window. The thing is that we also want the Anaconda environment. Okay, so what we want to do is we've downloaded our code and extracted it. We want to compile and run and visualize our first project. And so um, I want to point out that PhysiCell, uh, one thing we recognized very early on is that if you ask everyone to code every project from scratch, it's just completely insanely inefficient. And so we provide with every physical download some templates, including sample projects. Um, and so there is kind of a, a paradigm to get used to here, but I, I personally think it's nice 
that you type, uh, first of all, you can type make uh, list projects to get a list of all the projects that are currently bundled. Oop. Because it has to be a list of projects. So here this list the current sample projects that are bundled with Business Cell. Template 2D, Template 3D, the BioRobots sample we ran a little bit ago, uh, Cancer BioRobots, Heteroneity, that's a 2D model. Cancer Immune is a 3D model. And so that's the one, someone was asking about that. And if you just turn off the immune response, you've got heterogeneity example. Uh, my macrophage sample, and then a, a more generic template that's more recent. Um, and so the way this works is you type make, and then the name of the project, and it will populate that project's files into your code, uh, into your directory structure. Then you type make once more, and you'll actually compile it. Now, if you want to go back to a clean slate, you type make reset and you'll be back to this starting point where we are right now. So if you want to say switch from one project to another, you need to do that make reset. Uh, if you did a run and you generated a whole bunch of data and you want to do another run, you might consider typing make data cleanup to kind of get rid of the data that you generated in your last simulation so you have a clean output directory. So these are a few of the rules um, in the make files. So we type make list projects and what we want to do is to populate a project. So let's use that BioRobots sample project. So I typed in my terminal window here, I typed make list projects and I can kind of get the name of it now. It's BioRobots-sample, hit enter. And you see that basically this just copied a few source files to the right places. So now this has gone from a generic project to one that is specific to that project. If I type make one more time, it's gonna compile this thing. So uh, like many C++ projects, this is built by uh, a bunch of independent source code files that then get linked together into an executable. Uh, if this doesn't work, please get in touch with us later. We can help you troubleshoot your compiler. Uh, if you are running on Macintosh and you didn't run the pre-flight checklist yet, there is a system, there's an environment variable you need to set before you can compile these things. Uh, so that might be a common place to run into trouble if you're on Macintosh because Macintosh it just has to be difficult. We have not specifically developed projects for radiation biology, but it wouldn't be too hard. Uh, the nice thing about radiation biology is you don't have to worry about diffusion. Uh, you can just model it as a constant field, but you can model a response to that field pretty easily. Okay, so um, we have built our sample now. So we type make. Now let's go ahead and run the project. So here it's going to depend upon, oh, thank you. We'd love to work with you on it. Um, so um, I'm going to type ls for a list of things. Now I'm in Windows, so I need to type biorobots. I need to type biorobots.exe. Uh, PowerShell is trying to pretend to be Windows, except for slash, uh, Linux, but our slash is going the wrong way. If you are on something like like OSX or on Linux, you type dot slash file robots to execute your code. Um, Windows, you would need to type file robots.exe. So you can see my, my terminal window is trying to figure out what on earth I just asked it to do. Oh, well, that's miraculous. It started acting more like Linux all the time. Okay, so I'm going to execute my model. And you see that's starting to run and do something. And it should take just a few minutes to run this particular model. Um, so let me show you what's happening with the data. So we're going to go back and show you that, that directory that we have. Notice that when we compiled, a bunch of new files pop up here, these .o files. These are some of the, the compiled source code. And then you see your executable should be, here's my executable. Uh, there are a couple places that we care about. One is the config directory. That's where we store the configuration file for the model. Uh, the other one that you care, care about probably the most right now is output. This is where the data are being saved for your model. And it's saving as a combination of XML files, which we'll get into a little bit later. And uh, the nice thing is that, let's sort this more by type. If you scroll through, eventually you're going to see a bunch of SVG files. SVG stands for Scalable Vector Graphic. And we found that writing these visualizations is so fast that we just write them at real time while the model is running. This gives you a way to quickly at a glance see what your model is doing without loading the data anywhere. So you can just double click any one of these SVG files and see a plot of your, of your simulation. 
Uh, the nice thing is about scalable vector graphics is that it's already publication quality. Uh, it, it scales by definition, and so you don't have to worry about rasterization or, or image quality later. So that might, sometimes we actually use these for our, our publications. Um, so that's worth keeping in mind. So we have a bunch of SVG files that are being generated here. Um, so if we go to the very end, I was hoping to go to the end. Maybe if I sort this by date modified instead, I can go to the, the newest one at the end. And just look at a newer simulation. So you can see how a lot of these blue agents now are being, cargo agents are being dragged towards the directors. I think we have enough. We don't need to continue running this. So I'm going to hit Control C and cancel my simulation. Now, if you ran through the vector, uh, the pre-flight checklist, um, you will have hopefully uh, downloaded Image Magic, which is a really wonderful open source platform for image manipulation. You get a lot out of that. You get uh, the ability to resize and reformat uh, uh, images. You can convert them from one type to another. Again, you can stitch them together into animated GIF files. Now, I don't want to take up our entire time waiting for this humongous file conversion, but I suggest that you try these different things. Uh, you can either convert all of them, say this, for example, says use image magic to act on a whole bunch of images, to turn them into format JPEG, and resize them down to 30% of original size, acting on anything called snap, beginning with the letters snap and ending in SVG. So there's an the example. Uh, this one is slightly more complicated. So let's do the same thing, but only do it on files where the last digit is zero and the second last digit is either a zero or a five. So you don't have to do every single one. You can do some subset of them. And then here, this is say that once I have all those JPEG files, I'm gonna do a conversion from all those JPEGs into one animated GIF so you can really see what's going on. And that's an example over, over here. Um, let's see, so continuing forward here, um, you can modify them, you can convert them to portable network graphic format, you can uh, render them in different ways. Uh, here's the rather lengthy syntax to create an MP4 file from your simulation images. So if you have a bunch of images and you want to make an animation to share with someone to put into, say, a PowerPoint, this would be a great way to do that. And that syntax should give an MP4 that works both on Windows and on OS X. Uh, you, when, so that should be very nice. So uh, let's kind of go through more of the essentials here. So now I just did a big simulation and I have a whole bunch of data in that directory. Uh, and so maybe I need to do some cleanup. So if I type make data cleanup, it's going to clean up all the data in that output directory. So I'm ready to, to run another simulation and, and have rest assured that the data being generated are from the new simulation. Now the last rule I want to show you here is uh, make reset. What this will do is it will return us back to a clean slate where now we're back to um, a state where all those custom files have been put back where they belong and now we're kind of at a, a blank slate. We're ready for it to start a new project. So now I want to do is now let's work with another sample project but let's start working on how we change the settings in that directly in the configuration file. And so what we're going to do is we're going to list all the available projects, which I guess is almost an instinct anymore. Um, and then we're going to populate the cancer heterogeneity example that we showed you uh, in the first session. So make heterogeneity sample. That's going to, oops, it doesn't work when you don't type it right. Make heterogeneity sample, and it's going to populate all the custom files for that project where they belong. So we type make again to compile it. This time should be a little faster because all these projects share a lot of the same simulation source code. That's only the, the, the things that differ between the projects that need to be recompiled. So that was a lot faster to build. So now what we want to do is we want to change some settings. And so by most of these projects, if you go and look, there's a, something called a config directory. So you enter this directory, and you're going to see a physicel settings.xml. So let's open that up. And this gives you a whole lot of options to change settings. Is my font big enough here in this text editor to read? Yeah. 
here. I can make it a little tiny bit bigger. There we go. Now it's really big. So we're in. And if you scroll through this XML file, you'll see that the parameters are grouped in a bunch of blocks of, of settings here. There are domain settings, just like we had in the, uh, the NanoHub tab, overall settings of like how long to simulate. Uh, this is for parallel processing to say how many threads do you run at the same time. One folder that you might like very much to edit is the output directory. So if you change this to something else, say output one, it would save in the output one directory. But one quick warning, it can't write to something that does not exist. And so if you say that it should save to output one directory, you have to make that directory. So consult your operating system. If you had a terminal window, you could do a make directory output one. Or if you were in, you know, just browsing it in your folder, I have a few windows open here. Um, I could right click, for example, and oh, this wrong directory. Wrong window. I could, uh, I could just from here, make right click and make a new folder and call it output one. Except I seem to be still in the wrong directory. All right, here we go. Yeah, there's output one. But so just a word of caution that if you change that to some other folder name, that folder needs to exist. Otherwise your data will disappear into the ether because they will have nowhere to write. Um, so let's change some settings and, and do a run. So first of all, let's make this run a little faster. And the good news is I'm running it on my computer. I'm not at the mercy of San Diego anymore. Um, and so it ought to be a little bit faster. I'm going to change the maximum simulation time to 2160 minutes, which is you know, like a day and a half. Um, I want to change the domain to much smaller, say negative 500, 500. That should cut the simulation by a factor of four. I want to set the standard pre uh, deviation of the oncoprotein. So I'm going to go look for Here's microenvironment setup, here's user parameters. I'm going to look at the standard deviation, the oncoprotein and change that to three. I'm going to change the maximum value to 10 like we did in the last session. Should have been a 10. Oh well. And these next three slides kind of show you where to walk through in that parameter file. So I want to kind of get to this so we can get on to some of the other more interesting parts of this talk. And uh, Let's save the simulations every 360 minutes. So if I scroll through here, here it talks about all of our options for saving data. So I want to save the full data every 360 minutes. And now we're ready to run. So I already built this thing. The beautiful thing is if you change your configuration file, you haven't changed your code. So you can change settings without having to recompile. So I'm gonna run heterogeneity as the name of the executable. And this thing will start running. except I think Windows 10 has made this annoying feature where it insists on doing a virus scan on anything I've compiled because uh, it's a new executable. But now it's finally running, I think. So let's go ahead and let this run for a little bit. Um, and we can start looking at uh, visualizations. So we started off, we've already run our first six hours or 360 minutes. Let's look into output. So we can see these SVGs being created. Here is the 10th SVG. Runs a little faster than on NanoHub just because uh, we have more control over the processor here. And so we will let this run. It is about one third done right now. But while that's going, what I'd like to do is I'm going to open up another Anaconda window. And I'm going to browse to the same place so I can start, I can have one window running my simulator and I can have another one where I start doing some post-processing. So I'm going to be impatient because uh, that's one of my core strengths is being impatient. Um, and I'm going to start doing some of these commands. So oop, I forgot that I'm not in a window where I can copy and paste. So I'm going to run this here. So I'm going to go and run this image magic command to convert all of the uh, SVG files into JPEGs. And then after that, I'm going to take those, uh, actually I'm going to do another one and we're going to take all these SVG files and turn them into an animated GIF. 
So if you want to share your movie on Twitter, that's a very nice way to do it, actually. So that's going. And here's just one example under different parameter values. Well, the simulation runs already done. That's fantastic. So we can look here, and when the simulation is done, it runs something called, it makes a final SVG. And you see now, let me zoom in a bit with the browser window, how these yellow clones have really taken over, that they've promoted some asymmetry in the simulation. Uh, they're definitely forming these subclones that are kind of taking over the tumor. And now this thing has gotten big enough that's starting to build up a necrotic core in the center of the tumor. So there's just one example of this thing running here. And uh, we've done a quick visualization. So let's look at this out.gif. We can look at this, well, presumably. Well, I don't know what happened to that one. But let's not wait around forever for that one. Let's just keep going. But you can look at the animation later. Um, so let's keep going with the, the tutorial here. But what I'd really like to do now is get into loading the data into Jupyter, into a Jupyter notebook. Or in this case, actually, I'm just going to use it in uh, Interactive Python. So if we go to this link over here, uh, we have some source code that allows us to read the data into, into Python. I thought I was opening the link. Open hyperlink. There we go. And so let's go over here and go to the releases. Let's go to the latest release and download that source code. And I'm just gonna save it here in my downloads folder. And it's really enough much bigger than visit cell download. And that's because it includes a sample data set. And we may want to revisit that in the future. And the only file I actually need out of this is this one right here called PyMCDS. And I'm supposed to copy this to my root direct, the, the main directory of my physics cell download. So I'm going to copy that Python file. And now I'm going to have what I need to start loading data. OK, so kind of going back to our slides here, I went to releases, I downloaded it. I popped open the zip file. I didn't even bother extracting it, because all I need is that one file, that PyMCDS. And so let's go ahead and, and enter interactive Python. So I'm going to stay here in my directory. I'm going to type IPython to get into interactive Python. And I'm going to start importing. First of all, I'm going to import from uh, PyMCDS, import PyMCDS. So I'm importing our data loader methods. And then I'm going to do the things that are probably almost reflexes for everyone, importing uh, NumPy, np, import matplotlib.pyplot as plt. Now let's see what's available to us. I'm going to type pymcds. Oh, was, oh yeah, pymcds hit a dot tab, and this kind of shows us the methods that are available to us. Oh, the, as an historical note, MCDS stands for multi-cell data standard, which is our original data format that we use for the simulation outputs. Uh, I don't know what's going on here, but I don't need reminders, and it will close my email. Uh, so what we're going to do now is we're going to load a single simulation data frame using this, uh, this data loader. So, the syntax, wow, that's, whoever decided that red on black is a great idea is mistaken. Um, so let's go to the, to the PowerPoint window instead. The idea here is uh, the name of the file that you care about. So it's going to be output with some numbers behind it. It's always going to be eight digits. And then what directory are you in? And so our data are being saved to the output directory. So that's what we're going to use. So I'm going to do that and load the results. And it gives you some output that it's been reading some data in. Let's get some information on the simulation. First of all, let's get the uh, some metadata. What simulation time have we saved here? Well, it says time zero. Uh, this is more interesting. Let's get a list of what data are saved in all the cells. 
And this gives us a list of all the things that's been reading for individual cells, for cell variables, like position X and Y and Z and things. And let's get a list of all the diffusing substrates in our environment. And right now, the only one we have is oxygen for this example. Now, multicell uh, this data structure is a, a dictionary. So let's take a peek at it. And we have a whole bunch of, you know, we have keys, metadata, mesh, continuum variables, discrete variables. And so let's, uh, first of all, we know that the, uh, the oncoprotein is interesting. So let's go ahead and get the mean value of that oncoprotein. So the idea here is take np.mean. So that's the mean is in the MP director uh, uh, library. We can go into our data set, look in the data, look in the key for discrete cells. And for all the discrete cells, we're gonna get all the, uh, the Ankara protein value. And we're gonna take the, the mean value of that. And for this particular time point, we're getting a mean of 1.83. And now let's go ahead and plot a histogram of that. So we're gonna import matplotlib and set some variables for the histogram. And let's plot a histogram of our Ankara protein at this simulation time. Okay, now if that window doesn't pop up, I've been wrestling with this today. What I've learned is if I type percent plot lib QT, I should be able to plot these in a separate window. There we go. So now I've got my uh, histogram of Ankara protein. So we can see that, you know, it, there's a big spike of it here in the middle. And of course, if I had done um, more bins, you know, that would, that would look a little different. So there's my initial histogram of Ankara protein values for that particular simulation. So now let's plot some cells. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take advantage of the data structures here, and I'm going to save the X positions and the Y positions of all the cells, and I'm going to save their Ankara protein value for each of those individual cells. Or not really save, but kind of bookmark them really. So I grab those data. So for example, CX looks like this. It's a big list of X values. And I'm gonna plot a scatter plot. Now we're gonna plot the X position, Y position, and then color it by the Ankara protein value as a visualization. And oh, so you can see a couple of things that are stupid and ugly. One is I forgot to clear off my original histogram. So that's that spike there. And this thing is an oval, even though I know it ought to be a circle. So let's do a better job. So first I'm going to clear my plot and I'm going to plot these as a, as a bigger dot size. Well, I thought it was going to, I sure as hell told it to. There we go. So now at least the cells look a little better. They're a bit bigger dots. And really the dot size you need to use, the circle size here really is gonna depend upon your computer, your screen resolution and how big of a window you're using. See, for example, that if I resize my window, now these dots look stupidly small and I might need a bigger size. So I might change this to 100. And so it, it's gonna take some experimentation to, to tailor to your window. But this thing is still stretched out like an oval, even though it should be a circle. It's like the, the number one problem that people do in MATLAB is they plot these ovally things in their papers. You should do a plot uh, axis image, and now it's make, doing the correct aspect ratio on your axes. Uh, now let's add a color bar so we know what we're looking at. So plot.colorbar. And now we've got a nice color bar visualization for the Ankara protein values in, in this heterogeneous tumor. And we, of course, we can add lovely labels and title. And now we've got something that's starting to approach of something we, we would be willing to put into a publication. So there's just some nice plotting here. Uh, so let's look at a different time. Let's plot a later time. So we read the data. Uh, well, wow, someone scribbled on the screen, that's kind of cool. And uh, we did a plot. Now look how the histogram has changed. We still have this big bunch of things here at the left. We have a bunch of cells that basically are a lot slower to proliferate, but you had a big collection of them. But now the histogram is starting to shift towards the right because uh, things with the higher Ankara protein value uh, proliferate more, so they're out competing. So these bins are kind of increasing. Notice that the, you never go to the right of 10 because that was the maximum value of an Ankara protein. And there are no random mutations in this model. 
Uh, now let's find the live and dead cells. So in PhysiCell, we save as part of the data output the, the code for the cell cycle, for the, the cell cycling model, uh, it, either as a live model or a dead model. And we made a convention that if the model number is below 100, then it's alive. If the model is 100 or greater, it's dead. So let's go ahead and query this. I'm gonna get a list of, um, of the cells in the cycle state. So there's my list, there's my cycle variables, uh, the cycle state of all the cells. And then I can do this lovely query here, this argware in uh, Python. So that's actually kind of cool. We're gonna say, I'm gonna look for anywhere in that list of cycle where it was less than 100 and get that, and then get the argument of what got there. And then you have to do flatten to turn it into an array in, in Python. Basically you debug this once and you copy paste it forever. So let's pop this in. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to get live and dead counts. I can just get the length of these two lists. So n live, there are 1852 live cells, and there are 66 dead cells in this particular time. We can get the mean oncoprotein value of the live cells. So this basically gives us the indices of all the live cells. And they say, of all the things that are still alive, what's the mean oncoprotein value? We could also do it for the, uh, for the for the dead cells. Uh, and that's um, actually really a little bit higher. Okay, so now let's plot it. We can do fancier plots where we start restricting. So here I'm going to say only plot a scatter plot of the live cells. So I go over here to figure one. And now th those necrotic cells in the center have been removed because I'm only plotting the live cells. And there are a few isolated apoptotic cells that we're not plotting either. So you can do even fancier searches. So here I'm gonna paste this in and kind of walk through the code. Here I'm saying, find me all cells that are alive, that have a cycle less than 100, but also have an oncoprotein value of four or more. And then that's where this ampersand comes in, looking for this Boolean and operator, and then flattening the list. Then I'm going to do a scatter plot of only the cells with these indices. And so now we're finding things. Uh, so if I plot that, I now have a lot fewer cells. These are only the ones with have a sufficiently high oncoprotein value. So uh, we can also plot the substrate. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to plot the, the oxygen. This is going fast. And I, I want to say that I know and acknowledge and, and feel it for you on that, but I want to make sure we get through this a little bit. But I want to show you the, a taste of the ways you can plot the data. So we're going to plot the, uh, the oxygen now. And same problem, right? We need to do an axis image to get it squared up. And we should plot the cells on top of it. So I'm just going to quickly paste in the syntax, please do go back and look at the, uh, the slides later. We can see that you can plot all of your cells on top of the oxygen plot very nicely. And um, more clever people like Randy will know how to change the transparency of these cells so you can see the field behind, or maybe do a grayscale plot for your, for your oxygen field. So there are lots of things that you can do there. The last thing I wanna point out is that you can put this into a big loop and you do time series analysis. So let's just show that. Well, so this is saying go through and incrementally load another file, pluck up whatever data I care about and keep track of it and then do some plots when I'm done. So we can plot here, uh, for example, live and dead counts. So let's see here, there should be, here's figure one. There should have been a figure two. Hmm. Let's take another look at that. Oh, good Lord. I think I'm actually just holding the wrong thing here. This is what we really want to look at, actually. So here is the live and dead counts over time. Not too exciting, but that's something you might want to look at. And you can even do things like polynomial fits to estimate growth rates in your curves. So. Uh, I have some more slides that show some more interesting data loading if you have maybe multiple cell types, for example. Uh, let's not go through that now because we just don't have that kind of time. 
Uh, but let's move on towards the tail end of our talk here. So what I'd like us to do is to build a model uh, from scratch. And so we're gonna, unfortunately we only have like 10 minutes. So I, I don't want, uh, so I wanna first just apologize. That we're gonna walk through this. This is really, this is moved from a walkthrough to a run through now. Uh, but I want to kind of show you how some fairly simple steps can actually be used to, to take one of the templates and turn it into a model that is, is worth looking at. So what we're gonna do is, right now we're just gonna build model one. And then later on, I'll share with you the, the source code for models two and three. Uh, but here we're going to start with just the really bare bones basic cancer model. We're going to have proliferating cancer cells that are motile. They suck up oxygen and, um, and that's going to be designed in XML. So really our task here is to first in the XML configuration file to find any of the diffusing substrates, create the cell definitions and any other settings that we need. And then the custom code, we're going to uh, make sure that we pop some of those cells into the simulation so we have something to do. And so what we're going to do is we're going to clean up our data. So we're going to get out of uh, IPython. Do make data cleanup. We do make reset to get back to that clean slate. And then I'm going to populate in the template project. This is the generic project they can use to start building a 2D or a 3D project. And I'm going to go ahead and type make now just so that it compiles the files in there. Okay, and so the first thing I want to do is start adding the diffusing substrates. And here we're gonna have just one diffusing substrate. So let's pop open that configuration file. So we're gonna reload it because we've, we've overwritten it really with something new. And we're gonna go up to the top to the section of microenvironment setup. We'll get to these other things in a moment. So here we are in a section called microenvironment setup. And in this template right now, the, the, the first variable is called prey signal. It's not what we want. So we're going to rename this to oxygen. And we're going to give it units of N millimeters mercury, partial pressure. And I'm going to give it a diffusion coefficient of 100,000. This is in micron squared per minute. And a decay rate of 0 0.1 minutes inverse. And for those of you who are really more into PDEs, you're going to recognize that that if you have the diffusional length scale, the square root of the diffusion coefficient over the decay constant gives you the diffusion length scale. And here we've chosen these to have a diffusion length scale of about 100 microns for, for oxygen. Then I'm going to set my initial condition to be 38 and my boundary condition to 38. And so notice here uh, I set Dirichlet boundary condition in units of millimeters partial pressure. Enabled is true because remember if I turn this off, then the value, if I had set this to false, then no matter what number I put here, it wouldn't be applied and the code would use a Neumann condition, a zero flux condition. And for our model, we don't need any other variables. So I'm gonna go ahead and delete out all these other variables here. The second variable is project signal. And then the options I'm gonna leave alone. This just says that for this code, we're gonna allow it to calculate the, the gradients because we need to do chemotaxis. And that's it on the, X, on the substrates. Uh, the next thing we want to do is we want to go and work on the default cell definition. This is where you place the default parameter values for all the cell agents for all the phenotypic processes. It's going to be pretty big, which is why we put it into the default already pre-populated, so you can just make the changes you need. But then what you do is you define everything that's shared across all the cell types in the default definition, and then you make copies of, of that that can inherit properties, and you just write what you need. So let's get into that a little bit uh, right now. So if I go here, just next down the road, there's a section called cell definitions. And the very first, well, the zeroth definition is the default cell type. And so uh, we're gonna mostly leave this alone, but notice that our parameters are, are organized by phenotype. We have the cell cycle parameters, death parameters, including two death models, one for apoptosis and one for necrosis. Uh, then we have volume parameters. This would be your initial and target size of your cell. Uh, mechanics parameters, motility parameters. So for this, notice that we have uh, speed in microns per minute, persistence time in minutes, a bias, which is dimensionless. And then we have further options. It says, it says enable false, which means that this cell is not motile. The motility has been disabled. It is not enabled. The next one says that even if I were in 3D, if you want to, you could restrict the cell motility to 2D. And then the next block says that because we need chemotaxis so often, we have a built-in now. 
And so if this is enabled, then it's going to use chemotaxis as a form of motility. So if these, both these flags were true, and then tells you what to follow. One caution, we don't have prey signal anymore. So you can't reference it in the code. So I'm going to change that back to oxygen here. And then secretion, well, there is no substrate called prey signal. There is a one called oxygen. So I'm going to change this to oxygen, just so that we're there. But no secretion and no uptake yet. And then I'm just going to cut this out because there is no other signal. And then the section for other variables. So those are some of the caveats that, that I pointed out in the code. And on secretion, you just you can't reference anything that doesn't exist. That's kind of like a, a programming truism. Um, so now let's um, modify this a little bit. We, there's one more thing we should do though, is we want, let's have all the cells uptake at a rate of 10, uptake oxygen at a rate of 10. So we're gonna go into secretion and you go to uptake rate and change that from zero to 10. And that's pretty much it. So now the defaults are all, uh, are all defined, the default cell parameters. So now we're going to make a cancer cell definition. And we're going to make it inherit from the, uh, the cell defaults. So the easiest way to do that is to go and grab your cell default definition and just select everything here. And click copy. And then I'm going to get rid of all these other cell definitions that used to be here. I'm going to paste this one in. So I'm going to go back to this one that I just pasted in. Oops, I think I lost it. Cell definitions here. So I'm going to collapse the, the default one. Now I have to give it a unique name. So I'm going to call it cancer. I'm going to give it a new ID. I'm going to call it ID1. And the last thing we need is that it needs to know to inherit its properties from another definition. I mean, it doesn't have to, but it's ideal. So we're going to say, who's my parent type? So this says that I'm going to get my, I'm going to grab any parameters from default uh, unless I tell it otherwise. And so here I have this definition. And now the nice thing is, I don't have to set any parameters anywhere else in this definition unless it differs from the parent type. So I want to keep almost everything the same. Uh, I'm, what I want to do here is modify the cycling parameters. That uh, I want this cell type to spend 60 minutes in G0, G1 rather than 300 minutes and everything else stays the same. So I'm only gonna write the parameters that differ from its parent type. Uh, death, the only thing I'm going to change is I'm going to give it a death rate of zero. And all the other parameters I can just cut out because they, because they don't differ. So for the death model apoptosis, the only thing that's different from the parent type is the death rate. Likewise on necrosis, I don't have to copy all this stuff over. It's probably safer that I don't. And I'm going to leave that alone. Oops. Now you'll see there's an error in my XML because I'm missing a close tag. I'm a little bit too zealous on my deletion. Volume. I'm not going to change anything at all on volume, so I'm going to delete that section. I'm not changing anything on mechanics. Delete that section too. Motility. Uh, that's something where I'm going to change something, I think. So uh, apoptosis rates are set to zero. I'm going to set biosimilar migration to go up oxygen gradients. So here, I'm going to say that my motility needs to be true. I'll give it a speed of one micron per minute for now, persistence time of one minute. And I'm going to say that I'm going to enable chemotaxis. And I'm going to follow oxygen gradients going up oxygen gradients. So if this is one, I'm going to follow the gradient. If this is negative one, I'm going to go away from the gradient. Then everything else should be the same. So I'm not going to overwrite the parameters for secretion or molecular or anything. So I'm, I'm done with my cell definition now for the cancer cell type. So let's go back and just see what else we need to do. So we've set up our microenvironment. We've defined our cell types. Uh, we're going to see if we need any custom parameters. Um, in this case, I'm going to add two parameters. I'm going to add one for the number of, I, you know, 
I need to tell my code at some point, I'm going to get rid of all these existing ones in the template. So note to self, I'm going to make a cleaner template project for the future. But I'm going to um, I'm going to add 50 cancer cells to the front, and I'm going to say that um, what that character was that their coordinates should be bounded between negative 100 and positive 100. So these are just ways to set user parameters so you can change your simulation without recompiling it. And we've changed everything we need to change now. So now we're going to do a little tiny bit of C++, and this is the only thing that we need to do to get this project to build. So looking at our project here, we've been messing around with the, uh, the configuration with this configuration file. Now, the way this is structured is that anything that's very specific to your particular model goes here in this custom modules directory. And by default, we have one file that's really important is custom.cpp, and this is where you should be putting your custom code. And so we're going to look for a function called setup tissue. And here's where we're going to put in the code to start seeding in those cancer cells. Uh, I'm going to kind of skip to the solution here but I can walk you through it. That we're gonna get the minimum coordinate value from this parameter value. You can say it's a double parameter, it's a floating point, and it's called coordinate max. We get the minimum value and the maximum value in the range, which is max minus min. And then we're going to say for however many cancer cells it's supposed to make. So I query my parameter and I do a loop that says, until I reach the number of cancer cells it's supposed to make, I'm gonna choose a random position. I'm gonna create a cell based on the cancer cell definition, and I'm gonna stick it at the new position that I just made. So I'm gonna paste all that code here into my setup tissue function. And then I have just two very small things and we're ready to run this. I'm sorry, Pantio, we're running a little bit late here. Oops, I saved my PowerPoint, that's not helpful. We are within seconds of being able to run this code. Uh, I'm going to modify the coloring function just so that things are getting colored by their cell cycle status. So there is something called my coloring function, and that's actually where you would put this. And you have a lot of flexibility in changing the way cells are colored. And there's a whole chapter in the user guide on uh, section in the user guide on how to do that. Uh, and then the last thing is we're going to make sure that this code has not been modified to have any functions that override the custom functions. Just a really, I need to give a much cleaner template function for the future. But I think that's it. I think we're, we're done. So I'm going to type make. Oh, really? It will compile? Yeah, it compiled. And um, the name of our executable is project. So it's going to run, hopefully. I think Windows 10 is going to insist on a virus scan on those brand new executables never seen before. And now it's running. And this ought to be a pretty fast simulation because there are only 50 cells in it and it's a pretty small simulation domain. So let's see what's going on here and look in our output directory. I don't know why it's being so pokey right now here. Oh, there we go, now it's going. So we see a bunch of simulation snapshots popping up. So here is our initial picture of 50 cells that are in the G0, G1 state. They're colored by their cell cycle status right now. And if I go on, say, to a much later time, they've wandered out because they're all migratory and uh, they've advanced through the cell cycle status. So we've gone from 50 agents to 74. Maybe I should pick a more intermediate time of say one. See a bunch of them have entered the cell cycle. Two, they're progressing further and, and just wandering farther out. And so we might consider even putting a slower migration speed on this. But here's an example where almost all the model can be defined in that configuration file based on the template with some really small code in the uh, C++ to just place a few cells to get ready for the simulation. And we hope over time that more and more of the simulation design will go into the XML and it'd be really nice to even think about saying if we could create tools that automatically generate that XML so you can answer a few questions and start creating your simulation. 
and then do your, your custom coding. So that's the direction we're moving in the future. I'm, I'm sorry this ran a little bit long, but I'm really happy that we got to a point where we can uh, build a model and, and take a look at it. Um, so um, Adrian and, and um, Morgan, how should we move to questions? Should we just go straight to Pantia because we're running a bit too long here? So Pantia was going to start at uh, 10 after. So why don't oh, we just yay. take a break for five minutes? We'll start on time and uh, we can maybe just not cut out. And if you want to answer questions now, Paul, that's fine. And then at, uh, at 10 after, we'll, we'll start with Pantia's talk. Okay, great. Um, Randy, are there any questions that, you know, in this, in the chat window that you'd like to direct me towards that are uh, more in my domain? Um, I've sort of lost track. Nothing jumps out. Well, somebody did ask about boundary conditions. Let's see. What was a, oh, asked. Uh, no, we can't, yeah, we can't do Robin boundary conditions right okay. now. That would be really cool, but would take some, some recoding of the underlying diffusion solvers. Yeah. Um, and basically by default, it has Neumann conditions and then you can approximate to Richelieu conditions by overriding the, the value. So that's, that's how that works right now. Uh, you do have a lot of flexibility of being able to specify a Dirichlet boundary node at any point in the simulator, uh, but, but that's that. The, the other thing I'd, I'd like to point out, and actually maybe just go back to, to sharing screen here, uh, is you know I'll put the solution code for these on GitHub so you can see what they look like. Uh, there's some models to explore, but actually we're in the midst of building training materials for all this code. Uh, and the other thing I'd consider, encourage you to look at is that uh, the simulation, uh, Physicel itself comes with a really extensive like 150 page user manual where we go through and we document uh, pretty much every function, you know, code by code, line by line, and uh, give examples. And so I would really encourage you to just explore some of the sample projects that are already built and then look at that user manual and see if that's helpful for kind of detangling what you might want to do. And we're always happy to consult with people and, and help out uh, to say, hey, what do you have in mind? We'll help you set up your project and repository and give you some ideas on how you might uh, accomplish what you're trying to model. And we're very happy to consult like that. Um, so let me get back to the Zoom window and I can look for more of the questions. So it's a bit of a whirlwind but uh, we can build these much, much faster than we, we used to be able to do. Uh, when somebody asked for storage, Randy is right, it really depends on this 2D or 3D and how often you save your data. Uh, but you can do estimates, right? To say, well, if I've got n number of voxels with m variables in them and they're double precision, you know how big each variable is. And uh, that gives you an estimate of, you know, the diffusion solver is saved. And then if you've got a bunch of agents, let's say a thousand agents, and you can kind of estimate how many data fields are being stored by agent, that, that will start letting you estimate, you know, the, the data size. It certainly scales linearly with the domain size, which means from 2D to 3D, it gets much bigger. And it scales linearly with the, uh, the number of agents. Um, looking for other questions here. Now, rock conditions were something you're very interested in. That, would, that could be very fun. And I think there are ways we could approximate that. Uh, for example, you could probably do a custom function that acts on boundary nodes to transfer some flux in or out. And so you could do the Dirichlet part built in and then you could act upon it. Or you could just basically do it, uh, you could do the whole boundary condition really as, as a custom thing. I, I think there would be a way around that if you really wanted to do uh, mixed boundary conditions. It's just something we've never tried yet. It almost would be kind of fun. Um, any other questions? I think maybe you could take off your screen share and we can get uh, Pantia to share a screen as we finish. Absolutely. Thanks so much. That was great. I think I think everyone got a lot out of that. It's it's hard. It, it's a it's, it's a hard. <laughs> so and I appreciate the audience for being so patient of this challenging format. And I hope that you find this video and the slides uh, useful as you go through it uh, on your own afterwards. And next summer we plan to hold a hackathon and to host some people to come in and, and build models or to build tools. 
Um, what we love to do is to build things that make it easier for other people to build models, easier visualization, easier model building, an XML validator. Um, and I will hop off here so we make sure that Panty is ready. <laughs> thank you. Great to well, see you. Thank you very much, Paul and Randy, who did an amazing job fielding lots of questions um, for your insight into that. And like I said, I think everyone got a lot out of that.